Welcome to the Rev Your Agency podcast, the most candid and authentic life insurance and annuity podcast that is hell-bent on helping you be more honest, ethical, productive, and profitable. Tune in and you're going to get exclusive access to the industry's top tools, tips, tricks, and resources from the biggest and most effective producers on earth. You're going to hear real life stories of agents that went from nothing to something, zero to hero, and how changing the lives of their clients has changed their own lives financially. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show, and share it with someone you think will find value as well. We are live, David. Thanks for being on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm not going to make folks wait for it to get down into the good details here because this is such a treat. Um, For anyone who doesn't know who Mr. McKnight is at this point, if you want to sell more life insurance, if you want to do uh, not just more business, but more ethical business in the financial services space, you need to get to know Mr. McKnight and uh, what David is doing and what he's done over the last several decades has been amazing. It changed my career. That's one of the reasons I, I think I shared with you earlier this year when we did a, a webinar together that I feel like it's such a treat to be in a position where I get to talk to you a little bit here and there and because it's sincerely changed my life implementing so many of the things that I learned before I even knew you. I just read a book and it really changed my life. And so I'm really excited to have you out to DTDW in, in January. Have you already bought your plane tickets for that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I just wake up every Monday morning and I go where my calendar tells me to go. So that's, uh, I'd have to defer to to my assistant on that, but she's usually good at booking those things out uh, a few months in advance. She's pretty awesome. I'm, I, as we've worked with her, as my team's worked with her, they've mentioned several times she's just on the ball. So yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, you know, kudos to her, and then kudos to you. I, I found good people don't work for crappy people, <laughs> and it's funny how that works. Tell me though, David, what I want people to know. Like I say, they're gonna they can read about Power of Zero and look before you lerp and so many good publications. And I really urge people to go buy those. It's worth the money. You're going to spend what, 10 bucks. And I've made literally, I've, I've made millions. It's blessed my life and my family's life. It's changed our lives. And we've been able to change the lives of folks in our community so much more beyond that. Um, we get paid for being benevolent, right? And, but what got you to that? Where did the idea of tax brackets and mitigating your taxable liability. It's been around a lot longer than any of your books, but you put a lot of pieces together and you grow a passion for it. And I think that's one of the biggest things. So what's David's story? Yeah. When I came into the industry in 1997, there wasn't really any real emphasis on tax-free retirement. I actually came on with MedLife back in 1997. VUL was really the hot product in the market because it was the 90s. You drop 100,000 into the S&P 500 in 1990, take a nap for nine years, you wake up in 1999, you got $600,000. So it was all about VUL back then. So I was weaned on this idea of just VUL as a way to put unlimited amounts of money into a tax-free environment. The Roth IRA was relatively new on the scene. So the VUL was seen as the way to build tax-free wealth over time. And at the same time, Bill Clinton stood before the nation and his final state of the union. And he says, hey, I got great news. The national debt is $5 trillion, but we have budget surpluses for the next 26 years. So he's, we've balanced the budget. Things are awesome. That wasn't exactly an environment in which tax free retirement would have really uh, gone over all that well. And it wasn't until I met David Walker in about 2010, maybe, David Walker, former Comptroller General of the federal government, he started, he, he he resigned as the Comptroller General because he didn't feel like Congress was listening to any of his prescriptions. And so he he was marching across the country like an Old Testament prophet, as they said on 60 Minutes, raising the warning cry to whoever would listen that, hey, uh, we're marching into this future. We're fiscal, we're on this very un, unstable fiscal trajectory because of unfunded obligations for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. The debt doesn't seem very big right now. It was only $10 trillion back then, but it will grow unless we raise taxes dramatically. It will grow by $2 trillion per year on average over the next 30, 40 years. And we will soon get to a point in time where tax rates will have to double or we go broke as a nation. Getting acquainted with David Walker was a bit of a game changer for me. And it informed 
It informed the entire first chapter of the book that I wrote, The Power of Zero. I open with a discussion on David Walker. And the reason I do that is because I think it's so important. He's one of the smartest guys on the planet. He knows more than just about anybody else when it comes to these types of things. And I love drawing on third-party experts that know a lot more about this stuff than I do. But David Walker is still out there. He's still raising the warning cry. So that was one thing that really helped form me and mold me. Another one was I was in Wisconsin at the time and I started a presentation. And a presentation was a white, I love whiteboard. So I, I had a little whiteboard presentation where I said, there's three different types of money. We'll call them buckets of money, taxable, tax deferred, tax free. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, you've got most of your money in taxable and tax deferred. Let's try to get it to tax free. And it was a little five minute presentation. And I, and I came up with this idea, get to the 0% tax bracket, because if you're in the 0% tax bracket and tax rates double, two times zero is still zero. And so every time I would give that presentation, I've given it now thousands of times, every time I would give it, something would come out of my mouth just a little bit differently. And sometimes it would go over great and people would be like, they would be really impacted by what I said and sometimes not. But I honed and involved this presentation for about 10 years. It's actually started way back in 2004. So it's through about 2013. And I finally decided to commit that presentation after it had been honed and evolved over 10 years, committed it to book format. And that book was called The Power of Zero. And so it really didn't take me all that long to write The Power of Zero because it was just regurgitating that presentation onto the page. It took me about a week to write it. And I threw it out on Amazon, crossed my fingers and hoped that people would buy it. And here we are, what are we, 10 years later, and it's obviously sold exceeded all my wildest expectations. So those are two things, meeting David Walker and learning about his mission and uh, writing The Power of Zero as a result, as a, as the end result of having honed that presentation for 10 years. Those are two things that I think really helped get me to where I am today. That's awesome. That's awesome. There's a couple of things I want to unpack in there as you're talking. Do you feel like, because you're regarded as one of the leading experts on index universal life insurance in the space and rightly 1997 is when you began your career. Do you think there's any coincidence that you began your career the same year Index Universal Life Insurance was introduced? Uh, was that a catalyst at all or just pure coincidence? No, I didn't even know what an IUL was until probably 2003, I'll bet. I was. It was all about VUL for me. VUL was where it was at. And I did a lot of business back then with a company called Midland National Life. It was all VUL. And then one after the, obviously the huge market crash, and through 2003, people just weren't all that excited about putting all their retirement savings in something that could go down three years in a row, particularly after they had gotten so excited about what was happening in, in the 90s to lose all that money and lose a lot of what they'd earned during the 90s. They just didn't, they weren't all that enamored of the stock market. And so it was the perfect breeding ground for the IUL to just absolutely explode. And so I, and I didn't even really catch on with, well, probably until about 2009. So I was continuing to sell VUL because I thought the stock market will vindicate us over time. But then I got acquainted with some ways to position the IUL um, that made me understand that the IUL is not necessarily a stock market replacement, but it has some applications that are absolutely incredible, which I'll be talking about in an upcoming book. But it's the IUL can do some things that a VUL simply can't do. And um, so it's really been a focus of what I've been trying to do in terms of getting the word out for the last 11, 12 years. I love that. I love that. And I love I myself. I've been working on these books. I, I'd mentioned that to you and I'm taking a hell of a lot longer than a week though. And so I got to get off my doves and, and get it done. So what I was, how has the power of zero, the book changed your life? Because as I understand it, you didn't do the, the popular thing now is write a book and you do an Amazon bestseller push with some internet marketer. And, and that's not the route you went. You put value out there, hoping it was reciprocated back. And, and it was. How has that changed your life, uh, your family life, and, and the way you run your business, and, and what your even what your business even is at this point? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I didn't realize that the, that the that the power of zero was really a big deal until people came back. People would see me and say, "Hey, Dave, I was at this financial conference, and I looked across the row of advisors, and I saw three people reading your book." I just it's just totally blindsided me. I, I had absolutely no idea. I had a bit of a following in 2013 when I wrote the book. And so I think the first night that it launched, I think it sold maybe 500 copies. That was everybody who knew me, who liked me and followed me, they bought the book. So that was 500 people. So I had a following, but it wasn't a big following. But then people started to hand out the book 
to their clients and prospects. And they began to realize that, man, I can set the table for a conversation about tax-free retirement by simply giving this book to, 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 you know, to, to people to read. And there was actually a PNC advisor out of, out of Las Vegas by the name of Jeff Venuto. He'd never done more than $40,000 of life insurance premium. And I was telling people, look, take the book, send it out to your clients and prospects with a little handwritten note that says, hey, Mr. And Mrs. Jones, the other day I was reading this book. As I was reading this book, I couldn't stop thinking about your situation. Do me a favor, read the book. I'll call you back in a week. Let me know what you think. And Jeff Venuto actually took my advice. That's exactly what he did with his PNC clients. And the first full year he did that, he did something like $365,000 of premium, something like that. Finished number one in his company. I think he was with Farmers. And he did that the second year too, did about $367,000 of premium. So it was just, people started to, I still to this day have people come up to me, Dave, I've never done more than $30,000 of premium. Last year I did 300,000. That happens to me all the time because I think people realize that there's a really germane, timely conversation that takes place within the pages of that book. And when you hand it to a client or prospect, it really encapsulates the conversation in a really intriguing way and it makes it inspires people to want to act and so that's really the publication of that book is really what's catalyzed a lot of my career since then and with the publication of the book people want you to speak a lot more often so i'm speaking in a lot more meetings i formed my own producer group called the power zero power zero group and it's just been it's been very humbling and it's been very honored to be in a position where i can have a platform where I can foment this revolution, this this retirement planning revolution. 2018, Penguin Random House purchased the book and and published it in hardback, and that's given it some extra legitimacy and some extra heft. And then they also published Tax Free Income for Life. So it's been it's how I look back at my career. It's just sometimes you just gotta pinch yourself, but it's been a great ride, and I'm really honored to be in a position where I can help people. I think it's pretty powerful, actually. I know one of the things I had asked when I reached out to you about coming and speaking in Scottsdale was that I wanted to make this event different. This is our first year doing this, but we're going to do it every year. And I know you've only got an hour on stage. You'll be there hanging out, mingling throughout the throughout the day, which by the way, folks, is a huge opportunity, really huge opportunity. But you've got an hour on stage and, and you and I were talking before this, you have 10 hours easily of a value you could give what are you hoping to get done in that hour that's in alignment with, obviously, the, the values of this event, the, the values being sure, be entertained and feel better, but have something actionable you can improve your life and the lives in your community thereafter. What's your game plan? Yeah, so you're going to get a presentation that I've given at two different MDRTs and nearly every state NAFA meeting across the country. So this is not a presentation that I'm experimenting with. It's an experiment. It's a, it's a presentation I've given many times. So you're going to get the best version of me. Um, it's a presentation where really the first third of it, I talk about the fiscal condition of our country, the fiscal trajectory of our country, why experts think tax wage rates will double. I do some education in the middle where I talk about the three different types of investments and how to allocate the right amount of money to the right types of buckets in a rising tax rate environment. I And then I do a case study at the end and it all all comes together. It's, just, it's an hour long, what's going to feel like about 15 minutes. We go pretty fast. We pack a lot into that hour. But if you're looking to get inspired, if you're looking to get rejuvenated and energized on taking on the next chapter of your financial services career, I, this is a great opportunity to do it. A lot of people have seen that presentation and it's inspired them to take their their careers to a whole new level. So I, I think that if you want to be inspired and energized and rejuvenated in your career, I think it's a great event to be attending. What um what's your game plan? Because it's you've got an hour on stage and really it's an eight, 10 hour day. It's a long day uh, for a one day event, but you're there, you're mingling. We're going to have breaks in between and all sorts of things. What conversations are you hoping to have if you could, if you had a hope, knowing you the little bit I do, you really do want to help. What's your hope that agents will do instead of just come and snap a selfie with Mr. McKnight himself? What would you really want them to do um, in those moments? I have a lot of people say, hey, Dave, if you were in my shoes, maybe this is where I am in my career. What would you do? What would you do differently? And I'm happy to share whatever wisdom I, I can impart as far as those types of questions go. I've done, I've trained thousands and thousands of advisors over the last 20, uh, 20 to 25 years. And so I'm happy to impart any wisdom in terms of how to develop your career, how to take your career to the next level, really how to get really good 
a lot of times we get the general practitioners who love to be good at a lot of different things. I, I would talk about how you need to get really good at a specific niche. What are you going to be known in your community for? What do people, when they say, hey, what is the expert in X, Y, or Z? They say, oh, that's Carson. Of course, that's the person they think of. And so not so much going in half an inch deep and 10 miles wide, but maybe a half an inch wide and going 10 miles deep. What can you get really good at such that everybody knows that you're the very best in that particular niche? And that's really how you grow your practice. I like that. And for you, that niche could be tax retirement and or IUL and or switching gears here in line with that. There's a lot of influence. Social media has changed the face of what it takes to be an influential person. So there's a lot of social media influencers, whether it's on TikTok or, or YouTube, and, and you've been making a lot of videos addressing some of the things you agree with and some you disagree with. Um, and there's some I get asked about more than any. I was wondering if I could run maybe a few past you and maybe just get your, your little three to five sentence or, or three to five minutes of just feedback on some of that. Because I think it's, at least in this group, winning at insurance, uh, where we're live at right now, that's some of the most prevalent conversation going on behind the scenes with some of this stuff. So the first one would be, I've messaged you about this before, but it's MPI, Curtis Ray MPI. What are your thoughts on Curtis Ray MPI? Yeah, I like Curtis. I've had some dialogue with Curtis. I did film a video um, not long ago where I disagreed with Curtis on using the IUL as your exclusive emergency fund. I, I'm, I'm a traditionalist. I think that an emergency fund should be an emergency fund. Does IUL have liquidity? Sure, but it's not an emergency fund, right? And not maybe not everybody agrees with me on that. Obviously, Curtis doesn't agree with me on that, but we dialogue behind the scenes. And I try to keep as respectful as possible when I do these videos. So that's how I feel about using the IUL as an emergency fund. As far as the MPI goes, my understanding is that it works on paper, right? When the, you're not allowed to show an illustration that's showing all of these loans coming out and then going back into the policy as additional premium, you can't really show that uh, from what I understand in illustrations. Curtis has a spreadsheet that he has created that helps illustrate it. To me, it feels like there's a lot of moving parts. It feels like there's a lot of stuff that has to happen just correctly. Let's face it, in IUL, a lot of stuff has to happen correctly to begin with, right? <laughs> They've got to fund it properly. They got to structure it properly. They got to stick with the program for the rest of their lives. They got to take the right type of loan in the right year for all of this to work. They've got to have at least $1 left when they die or it all becomes the worst investment you ever made. So it's already tough to begin with, but then you throw in this regime where you're taking out loans and then you're using that loan to pay the premium back into the policy. To me, it just feels like a lot of complexity. I don't think that I'm denying that all of this adds up on paper because I know there's an arbitrage there, but as far as how it's going to play out in real life, I think that's a totally different story. And I think until Curtis Ray has got a track record uh, that he can point to, which in the, in the insurance industry, it's hard to have a track record. I just got interviewed by a lady from Market Watch. She says, how many different people have you had that have elected the long-term care, the chronic illness rider and your policies? I said, none. She said, what do you mean none? I said, I've only been selling IUL for 11 years. Those are people that were 50 and 60 at the time when they bought it. Now they're 60 and 70. People just don't have a lot of long-term care events prior to age 70. So I don't have anything to tell you. With the, When it comes to life insurance, you need a really long time, a really long track record to make sure that these things work. And so you, you have to see what the persistency is on these policies over time and see if people are really willing to stick with a program that's pretty complicated on the face of it a year later, they may not even remember what they got into. That's just some of my off the cuff remarks about 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 NPI. Yeah, no, and I, you and I had talked. I know you had mentioned that they'd gone through Monte Carlo testing and, and some stress testing. And I think on paper we've looked at it, and it looks good. The thing that I I still can't wrap my I can wrap my head around it. I don't. It's just the double the double indemnification of every single dollar when it comes to cost basis. And not exactly double, but it's significant. And each dollar isn't performing twice. It's performing it as illustrated, 50 basis points, 1.050. But, but oh, my goodness, it's just the, the additional fees. And then, like you said, persistency. It's such a complicated strategy for a, a business owner, an entrepreneur. Their brain's already doing complicated things all the time. I can see it making sense. We actually have a similar strategy. Um, but we don't reuse those dollars for new premium. We we use them for external opportunities and early liquidity and 
Uh, but we're every single year, every month, taking loans from month one. But these are, again, high net worth individuals. They have lots of investments. Many of them have a family office helping. But can Ma and Pa, will Ma and Pa stick with it? Because what I've seen in my career is Ma and Pa, when it's complicated, they don't stick with it. And if it's not persistent, then was it ethical? What was the point in the first place? I don't know right. what your thoughts are on that as far as persistency goes, but. No, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, you and I are uh, reading the same music and we're singing the same song here. It's, it's, it doesn't matter how much sense it makes on paper. If it's not going to ultimately lead to a positive outcome for the policyholder, then they would have been better off never having done it to begin with. My, my persistency, my personal persistency is something on the order of 99.8%. And so I'm not afraid that people aren't following through with my recommendations. But then again, I'm not making these incredibly complicated recommendations that rely upon taking loans at the right time and then reinvesting the money by way of those, taking that money and, and then reinvesting it and doing it over and over again. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, All right. <laughs> Yeah, it could be 10 years from now, I say, this is the worst thing ever or the best thing ever. We'll just have to see how it goes. Yeah. Time will tell. Uh, the other big one I've been getting a lot lately is Kirk Kirkpatrick. Chris uh, Kirkpatrick. Chris Kirkpatrick. I apologize. Chris Kirkpatrick. Lots of lots of whole life versus IUL question. And what are your thoughts on that? I know you actually just put out a video very recently, if I remember right, on this. Yeah. And the, t the tone of my video, to be fair, the first one was probably not as respectful as it could have been. It was a knee-jerk reaction to Chris Kirkpatrick's just overwhelmingly, monolithically negative take towards IUL. We've got clients and prospects that go look up IUL after we, we, we broach the subject of IUL. They go look it up on YouTube and Chris Kirkpatrick is the guy that's there slamming it. So I just didn't want to let all of his rhetoric go unchallenged. And so I, I've, I, if I do engage Chris Kirkpatrick in additional videos, by way of additional videos, it would be probably more respectful. Not that I was super disrespectful, but I just feel like some of his claims are just naked assertions. And like he did a video, for example, with a friend of mine, Andy Panko, where he just made a lot of just completely unfounded assertions. And, and I felt like it was my job to challenge those. That's how we advance the dialogue when it comes to these important financial planning principles. You don't let assertions go unchallenged. And as we challenge each other's assertions, then we move the, the ball down the field when it comes to sustainable retirement planning, planning principles. I just feel like he's got an agenda. I Do I believe in his heart of heart that he hates IUL? Yes. But he also, this is also something that's fairly commonplace with people that sell well, life insurance. Right now, there are some other people out there that have trained their sites on IUL mm -hmm. that don't sell either IUL or whole life or any other type of insurance. And so I, I, I would take a listen to maybe what they had to say a little bit more than someone has, that has an agenda to sell you whole life. He makes a lot of claims that are frankly uh, contradicted by the evidence. And for example, he says that IULs don't perform. I did a video where I gave you three examples of policies that did between seven and 9%, even during the period of historically low interest rates, right? Because he has this claim where he says, if IULs can't perform in one of the greatest bull markets of all time, when can they perform? Now, that's not the whole story, right? You've got, you've got to have good market returns. You've got to have high interest rates like peanut butter and jelly. You can't make a peanut butter jelly sandwich with just peanut butter, right? You need the peanut butter and the jelly. So we had a historical bull run in the market, but we also at the very same time had historically low interest rates. And so you can't say if we had historically high markets and historically high interest rates and IUL still didn't perform, I'd say, hey, maybe you got a point. But you need both of those things. You need an undulating market that's going up and down so you can capture the upside and you need enough interest rate to, to be able to purchase the options that will give you a, a cap that's high enough so that you can generate some growth inside those policies. And so my job is to tell the other side of the story, right? He can tell his side of the story and I will as respectfully as possible tell my side of the story. And if we engage down the road, I hope it's in a respectful way where it's not putting out a hit piece video or anything like that. Just to have a nice open ethical dialogue about what we believe about sustainable retirement planning principles. Is there a place for a whole life in, in your client's portfolios? 
If it is, I'm not sure what it is. My my problem historically with whole life and 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 Chris Kirkpatrick, for example, will say life insurance is not an investment or an accumulation tool. It's designed to be this pool of money that you can leverage in a, in a bank on yourself sort of a way. I, I'm fine with that. That's not my that's not my thing. People want to do the bank on yourself, benefit of banking. They can totally do it. It's just not my expertise. Okay. His position is that life insurance should never be used as an accumulation tool. So for example, for him, it's not such a big deal if you have a net cost of borrowing when you take money out of the policy. For me, that's a big problem because in all of my books, I talk about using life insurance to build wealth so that somewhere down the road, you can take the money out and spend it on your lifestyle at a period in time when tax rates are likely to be dramatically higher than they are today. And if there's a net cost to borrow, even if it's half a percent, 1%, 2%, I've seen them as bad as 4%, then that cost never goes away. So long as you're not planning on paying that loan back, and I don't think you should if you're trying to have it feel like a Roth IRA, Roth distribution, you're not going to pay that loan back. So that interest will continue to grow and compound over time to the point where it bankrupt, bankrupts your policy. I've done the math on it. It can bankrupt just a 2% policy loan and bankrupt your policy like 18 years in advance of when you ever thought possible. A 1% loan will bankrupt your policy 11 years faster than you ever thought possible. So I just don't want to have any surprises when it comes to snowballing interest. And so I insist on having policies that have the ability to give you a cost-free and tax-free distribution. And VULs historically were the only one that could do it. And now, you know, IULs have the ability. There's a, several companies that guarantee their zero cost net loans. And so that's a really big, that's a really big deal. Yeah, I think that's huge. Really huge. I know we're about out of time here. So I have one final question and I've learned to start asking this question in this podcast I recently released, it has nothing to do with insurance, but I've gotten so many amazing responses out of it. So I want to ask you as well, what's the most significant thing that's ever happened in your life? I could talk about a religious conversion I had and, and when I was 15 that set me on a course that has dramatically changed my life, changed the type of family I'm raising to change the lives of my children and, and my entire posterity. That That's obviously a huge one, meeting my wife with whom I'm still in love after 23 years of marriage has been absolutely transformative. We have seven beautiful children who were striving to raise in the same gospel path that we began 23 years ago. So really, it's not going to have very much to do with my career. But if I were looking at it from a purely lay perspective, I could say when I published The Power of Zero, but that's not really the important thing in my life. The important thing is that the path that I, you know, the decision that I made to take a different path in life when I was 16 years old, and then the woman that I married, those are the two most important decisions that I made in life. And I always tell people, marry the right person, the right time, right place, and that will determine 90% of your marriage or 90% of your happiness in life. You marry the wrong person, it's going to be really hard to lead a good life from that point forward. And it sounds like you have a, from what I've observed, you've got a great relationship with your wife as well. So it's, it's probably the most important decision you can make in life, the person that you marry. And I think that all this, all the statistics could bear that out. That's pretty awesome. Identify with that very closely. So very closely. Well, one of these days I'll share my story, but this is about you. Anything you want to leave folks with before we, before we call it a day? I'd love to hang out with you guys at, at Carson's event. And I think there's, if you haven't seen my presentation yet, you owe yourself to at least see it once. I think it'll transform the way that you view financial services. And I'll, I'm looking forward to, to, to hanging out with everybody all day long and, and chatting and answering whatever questions I have. This will be a great opportunity for you guys to ask me any questions you want. And I think it'll be a great time. I appreciate it very much. For anybody who watches this, I'll throw a link to the event in the comments. Go jump in. It's I don't know that there's a, a more affordable path to viewing the speaker lineup that that we have. It's pretty dang affordable, just a couple hundred dollars. Pretty great. So, David, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. This has been another excellent episode of the Rev Your Agency podcast. Remember something. Nothing happens if you don't do the damn work. So take what you've got from this. Take what you've learned and go implement it today. It's not about having everything. It's about having one thing and implementing it every day so that you can take your production, your agency, and the lives of everybody around you to the next level. If you could use some help with it, hit us up at revagencysyndicate.com 
and jump in. We run a mastermind that is dedicated and hell-bent 10 times more than this podcast could ever be into helping you have the education, collaboration, and accountability that you need to go to the next level. Whether you are captive, independent, whether you're life only, or you focus on multiple lines, it doesn't matter. We're here to help. Let us help you.